How are you going? And welcome to worship. This Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent, and we're celebrating hope today. Now, hope's a word I've used a lot in the last couple of months. I've said things like, I hope lockdown ends soon. Uh, I've said, I hope that my kids don't fall behind with their schoolwork. And I hope family and friends don't get ill from catching COVID. A lot of us have been living into that hope, haven't we? Um, This morning, though, let's remember the hope we have in our God. That it is through our God that we know a promise, a promise that we find in Jesus Christ when we meet him face to face. The promise that in putting our hope in Jesus, our God, we have a security like no other. So, however your week has been, good, bad, or ugly, Let's come together before God in prayer and remember the hope we have. Let's pray. Lord God, help us to hear the words from your mouth saying that you are our hope. We pray that we hear those above all the voices that are speaking into our lives just now. And that as we come to you, our arms outstretched, that we, in our attempting to cling to you, that you cling to us more tightly. We ask that you fill us with hope, and we pray for a tangible reminder today that the hope we have in you is unbreakable and a spiritual lifeline in times like this. We pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. June Reinick has come up with another beautiful Advent display and I invite you, I've invited you to purchase a candle and light it with me in the lead up to Christmas. So if you have bought a candle, let's light it together, uh, the candle of hope for today. Now let's join together with Jessica Jenkin singing Your Joy. Hello and welcome back. Today I'll be singing Your Joy by Deluge.
Thank you, Jessica. Leading us in prayers of intercession, we have Ian Johnston. Thank you, Ian. Hello, everybody. Even though COVID is everywhere in the world, life goes on. And how we long to meet as a church once again, where we can enjoy fellowship and worship together. But now we're in difficult times. But there is a saying that every cloud has a silver lining. And I hope that you have found times of blessings among the trials we're all going through. So let us pray. Lord, as Christmas approaches, we remember that it is a season of hope. Let's hope that during this war against COVID that we're all fighting in New Zealand and around the world, that we might see some fruit of our labours and get to enjoy some hard-won freedoms and some times of fellowship and some real joy as we get back together as families and communities under the new rules. Lord, we pray for our government. We pray for the choices and the decisions they have to make to bring us through this pandemic. May they have wisdom and compassion in all their decisions and bring us to a good place by Christmas. Lord, we pray for the leaders of nations like Belarus and Afghanistan, which seem to have huge troubles and insurmountable problems. We ask that as they see the need for social reform, they would look to those who can guide them into the right sort of change to deliver them from bloodshed. Often there are spiritual causes behind their troubles, and may the light of your truth pave the way for change. Lord, we thank you for those working to make our environment better for future generations. After 100 years of industrialization, we have depleted the earth's resources and generated millions of tons of waste. We have to change now to save the planet for the future of our children's children. Help us to cope with the changes necessary to bring in a new era of living on this planet. Lord, hear these prayers, we pray, and all these things we ask through Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you, Ian. Notice, notices, um, please have a read of the newsletter, and as I usually say, if you're not getting it, uh, please touch base with Teresa. Um, our church administrator and she'll get you sorted on the newsletter uh, mail out in our newsletter there um, is a message from the moderator of the Presbyterian Church which I encourage you to read and he um, also calls for a day of prayer which is next Sunday uh, the 5th of December now have a look at the prayer points that um, are in the newsletter which he highlights and perhaps over the course of next Sunday um, pray through those points right now though uh, remember to pause the video if you haven't printed off the blessing being bing, blessing beans bingo sheets um, uh, because in a moment Tangi is going to be reading the story uh, uh, from the Jesus storybook Bible now this is our last week uh, doing the blessing beans bingo for the year because starting next week uh, we have a new set of prizes uh, to give away. Right now though, let's hear from Tangi. Hi, good morning to all our Sunday school children this morning. Hope you guys are having an awesome Sunday. Um, welcome to our story time. Now, today our story is called A New Way to See. Of all people who kept the rules, Saul was the best. I'm good at being good, he, he'd tell you. He was very proud and very good. But he wasn't very nice. Saul hated anyone who loved Jesus. He traveled around looking for them. He wanted to catch them and put them into prison. He wanted everyone to forget all about Jesus. He didn't believe Jesus was the rescuer. And he didn't believe Jesus was alive either. You see, Saul had never met Jesus. So one day, Jesus met Saul. Saul was on his way to Damascus when suddenly a dazzling light flashed like lightning. It was brighter than the sun, 
It was too bright. Sol shielded his eyes and fell to the ground. He heard the loud voice. It was too loud. It was Sol. It gave Sol a headache. Sol, Sol, said the loud voice. Why are you fighting me? Lord, Sol answered, who are you? I am Jesus, said the voice. When you hurt my friends, you are hurting me too. Sol's whole body trembled. Go to the city, Jesus said. I'll tell you what to do. When Saul opened his eyes, he couldn't see. His helpers had to hold his hand and lead him like a little child. Saul was blind for three whole days, and yet it was as if he was seen for the very first time. Meanwhile, there was a man called Ananias who loved Jesus. Jesus came to him in a dream. Go to Saul and pray for him, and I will make him see again. Ananias knew all about Saul and how he hated Jesus' followers. Lord, he has come to hurt us. But Jesus told Ananias, Saul is the one that I've chosen to tell the whole world who I am. So Ananias went to Saul. Brother Saul, Ananias said. It was Jesus you met on the road. And Ananias prayed for Saul. Suddenly, Saul could see again. But he saw everything differently. He wasn't mean anymore. He even changed his name from Saul to Paul, which means small and humble, the very opposite of proud. And do you know what Ananias' name means? The Lord is full of grace. Grace is just another word for gift. Which is funny, because that's just what Paul, Paul's message was all about from then on. It's not about keeping rules, Paul told people. You thought you don't have to be good at being good for God to love you. You just have to believe what Jesus had done and to follow him because it's not about trying, it's about trusting. It's not about rules, it's about grace. God's free gift that cost him everything. What had happened to Paul? He met Jesus. Paul got a new job. He called himself a servant and traveled everywhere telling everyone about Jesus. He got shipwrecked three times. He even ended up in prison. God loves us. He wrote from prison. Nothing can ever, no, not ever, separate us from the never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever, loving of God he showed us in Jesus. And so it was, just as God promised Abraham that dark night to all those years before, the family of God's children grew and grew. Until one day, they would come to number more than even all the stars 
in the sky. Thank you, Tony. In the coming weeks, I'm going to try to pop in and meet a few people um, uh, in their driveways, um, uh, or uh, whichever way is safest um, with the COVID uh, requirements, um, and get videos of them um, to share with you all. Um, so this week we have Gwen and Phyllis Brock, uh, Chris and Judith Parry, and June Reinick saying hello. Living on a corner section with just a chain for a fence, we have not felt locked in. There have been plenty of opportunities to talk to passers-by. We've also had a double bubble with a next-door neighbour who wanders in with veggies and plants. I have enjoyed the many birds on our back lawn. They are there from daybreak to sunset, except when it rains. We also enjoy their songs from the trees. I look forward to celebrating Christmas in whatever form we can, whether together or separately. And we, we wish you a Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas from, from us from both. <laughs> Merry Christmas, family. Yes, Happy Christmas to everyone. It's really good to have been seeing some of you on the videos with the services during yeah. the year. Mm. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Happy Christmas to you all. Mm. Hello, everyone. I'm just wishing you a very happy Christmas. I hope you can get together with your families and have a wonderful time. Bye. Before we go any further, let's pray for our offering. Phyllis Brock will lead us in that prayer. Let us give thanks to God, our creator of all things, who loves us unconditionally. Almighty God, today we give you thanks for all the blessings we have received, and the ones we are aware of, and the ones we so often are not aware of. We are grateful to you for all your mercies. We offer you our gifts of money and ourselves in time and effort as we serve others in your name. Accept and bless these offerings and help us to continue to love one another as you have loved us. And help us to continue to spread the good news of Jesus' as truth and grace which is free to all people. We pray this in his holy name. Amen. Thank you, Phyllis. It may seem a bit early for Christmas carols, uh, but we're in Advent. So let's sing together, Come All Ye Faithful. Manu Ellison and Josh Johnson will lead us. Thank you, team. Hello, everybody. Let's all join together and sing, O Come All Ye Faithful.
This week reading our scripture is Brittany Nicholson. Thank you, Brittany. Kia ora, Church Fano. Today we are reading from the Passion Translation, 1 Corinthians 1, 17 to 2, 5. For the Anointed One has sent me on a mission, not to see how many I could baptise, but to proclaim the good news. And I declare this message stripped of all philosophical arguments that empty the cross of its true power. For I trust in the all-sufficient cross of Christ alone. To preach the message of the cross seems like sheer nonsense to those who are on their way to destruction. But to us who are on our way to salvation, it is the mighty power of God released within us. For it is written, I will dismantle the wisdom of the wise, and I will invalidate the intelligence of the scholars. So, where is the wise philosopher who understands? Where is the expert scholar who comprehends? And where is the skilled debater of our time who could win a debate with God? Hasn't God demonstrated that the wisdom of this world system is utter foolishness? For in his wisdom, God designed that all the world's wisdom would be insufficient to lead people to the discovery of himself. He took great delight in baffling the wisdom of the world by using the simplicity of preaching the story of the cross in order to save those who believe it. For the Jews constantly demand to see miraculous signs, while those who are not Jews constantly cling to the world's wisdom. But we preach the crucified Messiah. The Jews stumble over him and the rest of the world sees him as foolishness. But for those who have been chosen to follow him, both Jews and Greeks, he is God's mighty power, God's true wisdom and our Messiah. For the foolish things of God have proven to be wiser than the human wisdom and the feeble things of God have proven to be far more powerful than any human ability. Brothers and sisters, consider who you were when God called you to salvation. Not many of you were wise scholars by human standards, nor were many of you in positions of power, nor not many of you were considered the elite when you answered God's call. But God chose those whom the world considers foolish to shame those who think they are wise. And God chose the puny and powerless to shame the high and mighty. He chose the lowly, the laughable, in the world's eyes, nobodies, so that he would shame the somebodies. For he chose what is regarded as insignificant in order to supersede what is regarded as prominent so that there would be no place for prideful boasting in God's presence. For it is not with man that we draw our life from, but from God, as we are being joined to Jesus, the appointed one. And now he is our God-given wisdom, our virtue, our holiness, and our redemption. And this fulfills what is written, If anyone boasts, let him boast in all that the Lord has done. My brothers and sisters, when I first came to you to proclaim to you the secrets of God, I refused to come as an expert, trying to impress you with my eloquent speech and lofty wisdom. For while I was with you, I was determined to be consumed by one topic, Jesus the crucified Messiah. I stood before you feeling inadequate, filled with reverence for God and trembling under the sense of the importance of my words. The message I preached and how I preached it, it was not an attempt to sway you with pervasive arguments, but to prove to you the almighty power of God's Holy Spirit. For God intended that your faith not be established on man's wisdom, but by trusting in his almighty power. May God add his blessing to this reading. Sharing from First Corinthians, uh, Malcolm Sproul has our message. Thank you, Malcolm. Hi people, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity to share the word with you today. Um, so let's pray to start off. Father God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to share your love, your truth, your way in Christ via this medium. Even with the pandemic happening, we can still connect, we can still share we can still grow in your word. As we open that word today, Father God, may your blessing be on us. May you give us understanding. May your grace be upon us. 
May you open our eyes. May you lead us in the way of Christ. And we ask it in Jesus' name and always for his glory. Amen. Well, folks, um, the passage today, as you have heard, is from Corinthians. And what I wanted to point out, really, at the beginning of this short sermon, I hope, <laughs> is how marvelous it is to be part of what I would consider a healthy church. Over my lifetime, across all of New Zealand, uh, the full length of it almost, I have been involved in a number of churches, Baptist churches, Anglican churches, Catholic churches, Methodist churches, you know, um, the Salvation Army, Pentecostal churches, Charismatic churches, and of course the Presbyterian churches. It's been the Presbyterian church that I've been affiliated with the most over my life. And, and each, each church is its own entity has its own ways but one of the things I have found personally is that I have been disturbed in some churches where there is a feeling portrayed by uh, certain congregations I'm, not, I'm definitely not pointing to Presbyterian <laughs> um, Pepagora East Presbyterian Church in this regard but it's a uh, it's not uncommon to see uh, discomfort amongst people as they feel that they are ranked inside the congregation. There are some who feel less and some who have got positions of power and authority and um, that often can feed into dividing the congregation in time. And I've seen that dividing occur and be a key force for why a particular church has diminished in its congregation over time. Um, classic example would be as we approach Christmas. Uh, once upon a time in this little town called Mosgill in the South Island, in, um, on the Christmas Day service, it was not uncommon for the families to all arrive. It was a well attended service and um, it was maybe 10 o'clock in the morning and the families would arrive with the children and the children would arrive with their new toys that they had just unwrapped uh, from Christmas morning. And it became a kind of arena inside the church where some children had grand toys and some did not. Um, and that immediately portrayed an imbalance. Um, it, 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 there were children who, who were from really quite poor backgrounds and their parents had done their best but not bought a grand toy and here was the child in the church looking over the way at another child who was playing with some grander toy and feeling slightly left out um, because they didn't have a toy as grand as that one because that particular parent was more financial and could afford a bigger and brighter toy. I personally had a problem with that. Um, I raised it with a few people and after a few years we put a ban on that. We put a ban on bringing toys to the church after uh, on, the, on the Christmas morning service because it made it sort of tended to reinforce a ranking and a hierarchy and, and reinforce the discord or the variance between the types of people in there. Now um, what I'm trying to communicate I guess is a healthy church doesn't uh, participate in activities which distinguish or rank or fragment the congregation. And the, and the healthy church, by the way, is one that's healthy in its un unity around Christ. And when I look at the readings this morning from Corinthians and Paul's letter to the Corinthians, Let's start by reminding ourselves of what that church was about. It had recently been created by Paul, only a year or three before, and he had gone away for some time and he got reports back to suggest that there was dissension amongst the leaders in that church. Um, and it was starting to underpin, or undermine, sorry, the, um, the, 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 the essential message that he had conveyed in Christ earlier in the piece. 
But even if we look back a little further before today's reading into the tail end of Romans, at the end of it, he, he provides some personal greetings in the letter to the church, uh, to the Romans. And, at, and in it, you might note, if you do read that final uh, portion about his personal greetings, he mentions a chappie called Erastus, who is the city's director of public works. Now, this would be the city of Rome, and he was uh, a very high-ranking official who had committed himself to Christ, who had become a Christian. And so he represented one level of society in that church. Yet in that church were people also mingling who were, I guess, the poorest of the poor, who still found a unity not in their rank in society, but they were unified on another level. And that level was their um, united commitment, united awakening, united new awareness that had grown in their hearts, in their minds, in their souls as a result of being introduced to the truth and the way and the love of Christ. And here he is now having planted churches, churches in, in Rome and now this, this is the church in Corinth that he's going back to talk to. And of course he begins as we need to begin uh, today. He begins in uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians um, chapter 1, verse 4. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ amongst you. And I feel that that's a statement, or that's a that's a thanksgiving I can give, because I find personally an immense joy. While while you know me as a person attached to the Hanua Church, and I love that church, but when I when I go into Papakuri's church, I, I I get there's no more or no less of a thrill to be in the in the fellowship with the folk, you folk, from from that church. There's there's a wonderful um, sense of the gospel and the humility and the grace of God in that place. And I don't think it needs to be interrupted too badly by this pandemic. I think we can keep it going. Uh, and there's a way in this lesson here from Corinthians about how we can do that. Paul goes on in his thanksgiving, Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. But then, of course, that after that thanksgiving, he addresses them um, by pointing out that there are some who are saying uh, that they follow Paul inside the Corinthian church and some say no I follow Apollos and another says I follow Cephas and still another I follow Christ and so there's a, a hierarchy building process underway and Paul simply asks a vital question <laughs> a really a three word question right simple simple question in the, in the face of this divisive thinking, is Christ divided? Is Christ divided? And then we begin our reading. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now that... Um, is, is at the heart of what I would like to communicate today. I feel that um, there's always a danger we need to be monitoring. And especially in this pandemic time, we have some big questions in front of us, huge questions. How do we reopen? How do we come together as a congregation again? How do we, how do we deal with this um, virus which is so intrusive into our society and so dangerous how do we 
uh, open our hearts and minds and souls and, and convey the love of Christ and be Christ to people who have dis chosen not to be vaccinated. Um, and then um, all of those issues can sow the seeds of um, a divisive thinking. I, I can see how the divisions occur. And what, the, what is happening here in Corinthians is a reminder. A reminder for us to not be drawn away with all of that, but to constantly come back to Christ. Because the sea of communications right now is a flood with messaging that is biased in favor of a particular worldview. There's quite some hostility out there. Um, and we can easily be drawn into it. In it, there is a, a funda fundamental message, a really key message inside Corinthians um, for us, where Paul quotes from Isaiah some 700 years before, where the words, the word of God through Isaiah was given to the people of Israel, and um, and this, and he quotes this this little line here in verse 19: "I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligent. I will frustrate." And so it goes on in verse 20. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of the sage? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of the world, through its wisdom, did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to, have, um, to save those who believe. Well, I, I, I can... I can attest, and I'm sure you can uh, as well, to many occasions when people have regarded me as a fool uh, for believing what I do about Christ. So um, what I want to make sure we're clear of in this passage is that there is, a, there is a, an expression of foolishness and, and, and um, being a fool for God, but being a fool for God does not mean being stupid for God. The foolishness that Paul is speaking about is a is not a not a foolishness absent of wisdom. <laughs> it's only a foolishness in the eyes of the way the world sees it. The world translates it through its eyes, and its eyes are filtered by this thing called relativism, that everybody's truth is their own truth and 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 there are a zillion truths every other worldview every other belief system every other um, religion on the planet every religion on the planet has these uh, rules that are fundamentally about being smarter so that you are less of a fool about how to manage life um, the foolishness that Paul is speaking about really is not that. We get introduced to a new foolishness when we become followers and disciples of Christ. And that foolishness is expressed in verse 25, where Paul tells us, For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And I and I, I I love this particular verse. I, it's it's been a favourite of mine for for all of my fifty years of walking with Christ, uh, because it just continually reinforces the huge gap in the in the truth, uh, the infinite supply of wisdom from God versus the very finite definition of what is wise in the minds of of human beings. And then also it relates to the strength of God, which is infinitely superior and vastly bigger and infinitely vastly bigger uh, than any human strength. Um, so we need to really take that into context at this time in our country's life, in the world's situation of the pandemic and in, a, in, in, in the story of our, of our church. Um, because it, it underpins 
how a church stays healthy, no matter what. No matter what force works uh, around it, uh, and under what certain circumstance, it's how a congregation of believers become a, and continue to remain a healthy church. Um, there's no dividing uh, of Jesus, for example. There's no uh, um, you know, undertaking on board hierarchy and ranking. Uh, there's the care of the lowest of the low, if you like, and the least of the least, uh, along with the richest of the rich and the smartest of the smart, and none of them are better than another. They're all level in, in the arena of uh, the love of Christ. And it's a great leveller. But it's also a great binding agent to bring us continually together. When you are watching this online, even so, we are still connected. We're connected in God's Holy Spirit. We're connected in uh, the fellowship that preceded this pandemic, that, was, that, that, that the church was built on, a great history of how it came to be in Papakura, um, and, and, and the people who went before building uh, on the gospel and, and spreading the word and growing the congregation. It's uh, built around um, the truth of the Bible, which is unchanging through time. Um, and, and likewise, it's built on the same uh, stability and consistency through history of the story of Christ, which is unchanging, and also his ultimate measure, which is his statement. He is the life, the truth, and the way. Unchanging and outside of us, not a, not a construction of truth inside our own heads, but an absolute nature of trust outside of us that we embrace by embracing the faith, our faith in Christ, or putting our faith in Christ. That unifies us, that strengthens us, strengthens us, and that enables us to move forward, even in the circumstance we find ourselves in now. What Paul does to summarize it at the end of our reading today, he says, my message, in verse 4 of chapter 2 in Corinthians, he says, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. So we're, we're surrounded by a sea of people speaking wise insights and forecasting. There's an awful lot of crystal ball gazing about what might unfold. You know, while that might unfold, this might go that way, this might go this way type of stuff is happening. Christ knows exactly what will unfold. Exactly. With no variance, no, no, I don't know. There's no, there's no, I don't know what's going to happen next with Jesus. <laughs> He's fully aware of how everything will unfold. And we are best to continue to connect with him. And that unifies us as a body of Christ, a fellowship of believers. And then Paul summarizes it by saying, but with, instead of preaching with wise and persuasive words. He says it was with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So that your faith, your faith, my faith, our faith, might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. At this time, how do we remain a united church? How do we remain a fellowship of believers? How do we remain um, a, a robust set of individuals communicating the love of Christ, no matter what our rank in society. Well, we do it by relying on, leaning on, God's power through the cross, through Christ. Let's pray. Father God, keep us strong in you. Keep us strong in Christ. Strengthen our way, lead our way, guide our way in your Holy Spirit. Unite us always, Father God, so that we can be a voice united for the glory of Christ into this community. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Go well, folks. This week to send us out. We have Alison, Josh and Manu, and they are leading us in an excelsius Deo. Thank you, Johnstons.
Thank you, Johnstons. Now, if you have any prayer needs at all, please touch base with me via phone, email, or on Facebook. For now, though, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Go in peace.